In spite of committee reports warning of Irish dependence upon the potato, in spite of tragic lessons of past failures, and in spite of the evidence that blight was inevitable, when the first estimates were received that one-third of Ireland's potato crop had been destroyed by blight, Parliament turned a deaf ear toward Ireland. They delayed any action on the premise that the Irish were so inclined to exaggerate. As other counties reported in, it was obvious that the blight was spreading. As estimates reached 50%, they debated on whether relief should be provided at all. Some said it would make the Irish dependent upon handouts and lazier than they already were. Others argued against taking money from English pockets to feed Irish mouths. And landlords ensured that existing laws were enforced, preventing relief crops from being imported into Ireland since it would reduce the market value of their own crops. While these arguments were being debated, men, women, and children were going hungry in a country where a bumper harvest left the seaports for profit. For in England, too, the potato crop had partially failed and potatoes became a luxury. In France, Belgium, Holland, and Italy, where the crop also failed, food prices rose steeply. As prices rose, the few potatoes that did grow, as well as other crops, were sold to the continent for higher profit instead of relieving distress in Ireland. To make matters worse, in order to maintain the landlord's prices, the government purchased surplus grain and stored it in granaries in the very districts where the Irish were starving. The landlords successfully fought the free distribution of that grain, claiming it would reduce the price of their crops. Parliament's first reaction to the cries of help from Ireland was not to send food, but troops. Troops to protect the surplus crops from the starving Irish and to escort the food convoys to the seaports. Rent, tax, and tithe collectors badgered the starving Irish who tried to beg them off until the following year's crop could redeem their meager holdings. Those who could borrowed against the hope of a future harvest. Those who couldn't had to surrender what little livestock or household possessions they had to satisfy their debts. Some even pawned their extra clothing, coats, and blankets to purchase food to survive the shortage until the next harvest when they would redeem them. No one could have foreseen that the coming winter would be the worst in memory. Those who had nothing of value were evicted from their meager holdings and left to wander the roads. Some families fought the evictions, but it was to no avail, for the landlord's rights were protected by the military and the Irish were still evicted and left to protect what few possessions they had through the bitter winter. The suffering of those who had pawned their clothing can only be imagined. Something had to be done, so Parliament reluctantly introduced relief measures, but they were insensitive and thoughtless. For example, early in the failure, instructions were issued on how to prepare and eat the diseased potato. Those who did fell ill almost immediately. And then Prime Minister Peel ordered maize or American Indian corn because it was cheap and didn't compete with the landlord's products. But to replace three and a half million pounds worth of lost potatoes, he bought only a hundred thousand pounds worth of maize. Further, the American charge d'affaires warned that maize was too hard to eat. It had to be ground or chopped. Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, Lord Trevelyan, thought this preparation an unnecessary expense, saying that dependence upon charity is not to be made an agreeable mode of life. He ordered the maize distributed unground, and the hard, pointy kernels punctured intestines already weakened by hunger, especially in the bellies of the children. Meanwhile, at this time, 12,000 army and police horses in Ireland were receiving a daily allocation of 10 pounds of grain per animal. A suggestion was made that reducing the allotment to 8 pounds per horse would not harm the animals, but would make 24,000 pounds of grain a day available to feed the Irish. The suggestion was rejected. Public works were established to provide employment, but Trevelyan imposed qualifications for getting government funds which were too complicated and time-consuming to be of immediate benefit.
In some cases, the relief measures fell into the hands of corrupt administrators who felt that this was a windfall for lining their own pockets until the next harvest when the opportunity would be gone. Finally, even though Prime Minister Peel's assistance was inadequate, others considered it too liberal and his government fell to Lord John Russell and the Whigs. In June of 1846, Russell took over as Prime Minister and closed down the Relief Commission. Trevelyan agreed and ordered the closing of public works. In Ireland, those who ran honest relief works objected, for even though a man received only a shilling a day when 21 shillings a week was the minimum to support an average family, it was all they had to hold them until the next harvest. Appeals fell on deaf ears. Trevelyan further ordered that when Peel's Indian corn ran out, no more was to be purchased. By now, the Irish had learned to soak and boil the corn for days to make it edible. Yet on July the 8th, 1846, Trevelyan turned away a cargo of Indian corn, telling the owners, dispose of it as you see fit. And then it happened. The potato crop of 1846 that everyone had relied on was almost totally destroyed. International charity was also a factor, but Parliament stipulated that all goods coming to Ireland had to come on British ships, and freight charges were so high that it minimized potential generosity. One account had the people of Massachusetts sending a ship of grain that authorities put in storage, claiming that it would upset trade. On the other hand, the Choctaw Nation of Native Americans made a remarkable donation having just been forcibly relocated from Alabama to Oklahoma in a tragic journey known as the Trail of Tears, which decimated the tribe in numbers and assets, they were still moved to donate $170 from their seriously depleted resources. It was donated through the Quakers, who were singularly the most effective source of relief. But even the generous Quakers eventually gave up claiming that they could not prevent a disaster so huge in the face of government apathy. The situation became hopeless as disease began to ravage the once healthy Irish and they began to die in great numbers. Hospitals, which should have been prepared for the tragedy, were too few, ill-equipped and understaffed. In no time at all, they became overcrowded incubators of affliction. One Dr. Stevens upon visiting Bantry Hospital, wrote, Language would fail to give an adequate idea of its state. It was appalling, awful, heart-sickening. I did not think it possible to exist in a civilized and Christian community. Patients lying naked on straw, the living and the dead together. No one had been near the hospital for two days. There was no medicine, no drink, no fire. Wretched beings were crying out, Water, water but there was no one to give it to them. Some of the workhouses were opened, but only for the totally destitute, most of whom were too weak to work. So they too lay in disease-infested facilities until they died. Thousands died in these facilities of disease and neglect. Today, some critics still hold Britain responsible. It's probably best defined as genocide by indifference because they could have helped and didn't. They didn't come in and actually kill the Irish, but they turned their backs on them when they were dying, and they could have helped. There are sins of omission, just as there are sins of commission. The dying Irish became victims of human parasites as perfidious promises were made for possessions signed over, shopkeepers provided food on credit at exorbitant prices, and loan sharks were everywhere. These dreaded gumbine men, as they came to be known, soon took their place with the informer in the Irish Dictionary of Scoundrels. Some evangelistic opportunists even saw the chance to convert the Irish by offering free soup or porridge in exchange for a rejection of their Catholic faith. Some of the starving Irish accepted. Some later recanted that acceptance but most turned away, submitting to their suffering, but ensuring their place in the paradise that their faith promised them. Parliament, instead of accepting the responsibility for relief, passed a law making the landlords responsible for their tenants. In 
To rid themselves of that burden, the landlords dispossessed their tenants and turned their land over to sheep and cattle grazing. The starving Irish took to the roads and began to pilfer the landlord's crops and livestock. The furious landlords protested, and to stem the rising unrest, a crime and outrage bill was quickly passed, and thousands more troops were sent to Ireland. Curfews were even enforced in some districts, and those out after dark were subject to arrest, including the dispossessed Irish, who had no place to go. Throughout this time, men were sent to penal facilities, women were sent to the colonies as indentured servants, and children became little more than slaves in the factories and sweatshops spawned by the recent Industrial Revolution. Many also fled on notorious coffin ships amid scandalous conditions, but that's another story. Everything edible above and below ground was devoured, including the seed potato for next year's crop. Parliament was urged to distribute new seed, but they refused on the grounds that it might create a dependence on the part of the Irish. The bitter irony is that there was less blight in 1847, but only slightly less. Consequently, Trevelyan declared the disaster was over and readily closed the book on the subject. But the facts of 1847 tell a different story. True, there was less evidence of blight, but that's because there was less that was planted. Entire towns had been emptied of tenants. Those who had been dispossessed had no land on which to plant. Those who had eaten their seed potato to survive had nothing to plant, while still others had fallen victim to the diseases that attend starvation and were unable to plant. But Parliament's refusal to furnish the seed potatoes was the fatal factor. Though 1847 saw less blight, it saw more distress as hundreds of thousands of starving people poured into Ireland's towns and cities in search of relief and epidemics of typhoid fever, cholera, and dysentery broke out, adding to the death toll of the evicted masses starving on the roadside. The result was the largest number of fatalities to date. Revisionists close the book at this point since they find it impossible to explain the incredible number who perished of hunger and disease in a country in which they claimed that the disaster was over. The Irish remember it, though. They call it Black 47. And the question remains, how could Parliament declare the tragedy over when the situation continued to be reported? Here is Ryark reporter Peter Kelly. The Dublin Freeman's Journal reported in April 1847 of an inquest held here in Bantry, where the jury brought in a general verdict of willful murder against Lord John Russell, Prime Minister of England who, they said, as head of the government, had the power to keep people alive and would not do so. The hope that 1847 could have provided was dashed, and efforts to plant extra for the next harvest were wasted when the blight returned in 1848. Jails became a refuge as honest men commit crimes just so they could be sent to prison where they would at least receive a meal. A group of landed gentry agitated for tenants' rights, and Parliament sent troops to arrest the leaders, forcing the organization into a premature rebellion which was easily put down. The leaders fled to France and America, leaving the starving Irish tenants to bear the brunt of Parliament's rage. Using the rising crime rate as a pretext, Parliament punished the Irish by officially abandoning them, as they said, to the operation of natural causes. It was now too late to save Ireland. Those still alive were mere shells of human beings, and so it carried through the winter and into 1849 when the blight returned again. And Parliament was still aware of the devastating consequences of their inaction. Here again is Peter Kelly. Late in 49, the Illustrated London News sent another artist journalist to report on the state of Ireland. His illustrated reports were published in the issues of late December and early January 1850. Outdoor relief was established in that season of distress 
and relief was coupled with the resignation of the land. The poor were required to give up their heritage, small though it were, for less than a mess of pottage. A law was passed entitled, An Act for the Protection and Relief of the Destitute Poor Evicted from Their Dwellings, which provided a means of evicting them. The system, intended to relieve the poor by making the landlords responsible for their welfare, has at once made it the interest and therefore the duty of the landlords to get rid of them. The public records, my own eyes, a piercing wail of woe throughout the land, all testify to the vast extent of the evictions at the present time. The ruin is great and complete. They are prostrate and helpless. The once frolicsome people, the saucy beggars, have disappeared and given place to wan and haggard objects who are so resigned to their doom that they no longer expect relief. One beholds only shrunken frames, scarcely covered with flesh, crawling skeletons who appear to have risen from their graves. At Karihaken, the levellers have been at work and tumbled down 18 houses. In one of them dwelt John Killian, who stood by me while I made the accompanying sketch of the remains of his dwelling. He told me that he and his fathers before him had owned this now ruined cabin for ages and had paid four pound a year for four acres of ground. He owed no rent. Before it was due, the landlord's drivers cut down his crops, carried them off, gave him no account of the proceeds, and then tumbled his house. At Uktarad, some 30 houses have been recently demolished, and gentlemen who witnessed the scene told me nothing could exceed the heartlessness of the levellers if it were not for the submission of the sufferers. They wept indeed. The children screamed in agony at seeing their homes destroyed and their parents in tears but the latter allowed them unresistingly to be deprived of what is, to most people, the dearest thing on earth next to their lives. In Ennis, in one small room not 20 feet square, I found congregated 15 people, young and old, exhibiting nearly all the phases of want and squalor. And it was with difficulty I could make out the forms of the wretched groups or of the squalid and dying child on the floor. The village of Kalard forms part of the union of Kilrush. It had a population of 6,850 souls in 1841. What has become of the 6,850 souls I know not, but not 10 houses remain of the whole village, but a few mouldering walls and piles of offensive thatch turning into manure. Kilard is an epitome of half Ireland. There was nothing left to do but bury the dead. This memorial tombstone was recently erected over a mass grave in what was the town of Lisnabinny in County Cork. The inscription in Irish at the top of the stone reads, What have you done, said the Lord? Listen, the weak voices of your brothers call on me from the ground. And that brings us to the question that always arises. How many actually did die? We shall discuss that in our final part.